and we are live. So, hi everyone, um, welcome back to a, another manufacturing live stream this week. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been on, me and Spencer have been far too busy, but we, uh, we couldn't stay away from the live streams for too long. So for anyone, if this is your first live stream with us, um, my name is Richard Stubbley. Um, I work Broadcast as part of the Process Specialist team. Um, I'm out of the Birmingham office at the moment. So Birmingham, UK, we've got a massive tech centre here. Lots of really cool equipment. Um, I'm not actually used to seeing any equipment in today's live stream, but um, I'm in here working, so I thought I'd do the stream from here. Spence, go for who you are. Yeah, hi everybody. Great to be back on a live stream with you, Rich. It's been uh, a couple of weeks, I guess, now, right? So uh, good to be uh, good to be back. Um, for those who haven't watched us before, Spencer Hyde Kessel. Um, I work in the customer advocacy team, uh, focusing on customer engagement, really. And uh, what better way to engage with customers than on a YouTube live stream with you, Rich? Not, not at all. I hope everyone's enjoyed the update this week. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, there's some, some real nice bits in there. Um, I, it's a bit annoying because me and Spence, of course, can see to the future as usual. We, we know what's coming, and it's so difficult at times when we're speaking to customers going, just honestly, please wait. Just just wait, and you'll be amazed. So it's, 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 you know it's quite a nice thing to be able to see what's coming, but then it's also a bit of a a pain when you try to explain to people it is there trust us but we're just going to get it fixed and get it polished and get it out absolutely what was your favorite feature rich of this uh, this release Ooh. i know this sounds really trivial but arrow keys to go up and down the, the browser yeah. i, I don't Lovely, know why isn't it? but it's just just feels like why, why wasn't it there all the time i know i know uh i saw a really good comment actually about the next step that they could take actually using the tab key to open anything collapsed oh, okay. and then enter to actually edit. I saw edit. edit to edit. That was a good, that was a good shout. Yeah. A couple of good ones there, isn't there? Yeah, it is. I think my favorite has got to be, I'm going to go left field. What? I really, based on the work that I've done, should say the nest in a publication extension, I guess. Yeah, you really should. <laughs> but I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, a small change that I think will help a lot of people. So there's actually, in a sketch, you can now do uh, sketch chamfers. Oh, yes, I saw that. Yes. Which uh, was always a bit of a pain um, to do before because, of course, you'd have to figure the angle out and, and the oh, two distances, yeah, yeah. whereas now it's uh, right there in your sketch. So uh, I'm going to say that. I'm yeah. going to go a little bit left field and say that. Yes, if anyone didn't actually catch it, Spencer's released a really good series on the nesting and fabrication extension. So anyone out there that does anything with sheet material, watch it and you'll love it. Um, I published one on how to import the macro results from probing as well. So again, lots of good content getting out there. Watch the videos, let us know. Again, we try and do what you all want us to do more than anything else. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Let, let us know in the comments. In the chat, in the comments, what was your favourite feature? What did you like about the uh, the latest release? Yeah, let's get cracking with the live stream then. Please let us know if there are any problems with the audio or video. I'm trying to get my audio to sound better when I'm in the tech centre. I think it's been the active noise cancellation that's been making me a bit robotic. So let me know if it's any better this week So I've got it all turned off. Again, filming in the tech centre with all the machines going is never the easiest thing. But go on, Spencer, over to you this week for the first slide. Oh my word, the privilege, the privilege. So um, what we decided to do this week was open with a little update from the forums. And because this tends to be a bit of a manufacturing focused call, um, we decided to look at the manufacturing board and maybe we'll change it up in, in future live streams. But for this this time, we'll, we'll stick to manufacturing and um, call out a bit of a few statistics just to kick us off. So just over 6,000 of you visited the manufacturing board um, in in February uh, with just over 1,200 replies. So awesome collaboration, awesome uh, community there, um, helping people, giving advice uh, back and forth. It's really good to see. Um, to almost 270 kudos or, or likes 
Um, so, so people are giving some really good information and almost a hundred solutions. So, um, people getting the right answer in the end, which is always good to see. Um, we also thought we go, uh, we go and call out the top 10 forum contributors. So sadly for Rich, we didn't include employees. Otherwise I think he would be making an appearance, but, uh, as you see there at the bottom of the bottom of the screen, um, you know, awesome contributions from, from Vic Costa, from Daniel Lyle, um, Matt DeLaRue, engine guys always up there. Um, great to see, to see all the top 10, but great to see the, the contributions from everybody on the forums. And if you've never checked out the forums, check it out. It's a, it's a really good place to get feedback, to, to ask questions, um, so go check it out. Forums.autodesk.com uh, is, is the, uh, the URL you need for that. And then lastly, what I'd like to do on, on maybe the monthly cadence is to just pick out um, one thread that I think would really benefit people. And, and this time uh, we got this particular thread. So in the top right hand corner of the screen, you see, you see a part. The part is in, uh, in a vice um, and it's been machined on setup one. Uh, the question was, well, then how do I machine set up two with accurate stock? And, and how do I bring in the, 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 the work holding? And so historically, what we would always say here was uh, do the simulation, uh, right click on that simulation. You can actually save it as a stock. So you can save that stock as, a, as an STL file. You then bring that STL, STL file back in uh, and you can actually use that as the starting point um, uh, for the for setup two. So as you're defining your stock, you go ahead and you choose from solid, select the STL, uh, and that will be a starting point for all subsequent toolpaths on, on the second setup. Uh, a second option, which seems really easy and something that I've never thought about doing before, um, was if on setup when you're fully machining your part, then really all you need to do is make a copy of that body, uh, draw a rectangle that matches the dimensions of your stock, uh, extrude and choose the operation, uh, the operation of join, and you're gonna, you've got your, your stock for your second setup. A really simple way um, of, of going about it. Obviously this will only work on certain models, but a uh, really interesting way to, uh, to get involved. And then lastly, something that is uh, new to the scene um, and to access it, you're gonna have to go open your, your preview features and your preferences and go ahead and turn on um, continue rest machining for milling. And what you'll see then is if you create a second setup in the stock tab, as you can see from that image, right on the left-hand side, you've got from preceding setup. So if you go ahead and select that, what you'll see is that it's automatically taken care of for you. You don't have to export and re-import any STL models. You don't have to do some, some edits on a second body. It's all taken care of you right then and there with uh, automatically by this from preceding setup option. So three ways achieving the same thing um, with a varying level of difficulty. But if you haven't tried it yet, I would strongly recommend go ahead and turn on that continue rest machine and for milling option, um, make your lives a little bit easier, less uh, exporting and importing, and uh, go ahead and machine your second setup. And I think with that, I'll kick it over to back to Rich for uh, the rest of the live stream. Right. Let me know in the comments any questions, and I'll uh, I'll. I'll make sure to pass these to Rich. And if you've got any comments for the for the forum related stuff, I'll be happy to answer them as well. Cheers, man. Thank, thank, thanks very much for that. That was what I was, Again, everyone, thanks to everyone who contributes to the forum. Um, I really like the community. I haven't got many friends, and I like to feel that you're all my friends then on the uh, on the on the forum. Um, the especially I want to call out some of the Autodesk employees that are on there. Please bear in mind that none of us are. Not, it's none of our jobs to be on the forum, but we all really like the community that we've got around Fusion. So. We all try and contribute as much as we can. You watch most of us are 
our, our contributing outside of working hours. Yeah, we're trying to do it as and when we can to help people out. So I just want to say thanks to everyone, Autodesk employees, people running machine shops, hobbyists, everyone. You do an amazing job at uh, bringing everyone together and, and sharing the knowledge. So right, me and Spencer were trying to think of a topic for this live stream, and I said, I'll tell you what, let's look at defaults and expressions and all those type of things, because the way that everyone programs parts is very different, and no one is normally wrong. They just have to do it dependent on their machine. Again, I've got the Haas VF2 behind me. I've got the DMU125 in front of me, and I would have exactly the same part on both of them, but I've programmed them very differently because of you know how the machines are, the different strengths, the weaknesses of them. Again, same as my little Denford Nova mill at home. I'd have to model that. I'd have to manufacture it completely separately. So, how can you? So, so how can we as Autodesk provide some software that works out of the box? So we, what we have to do is we have to do our best guess in what's going to hopefully work for as many people as possible. But that doesn't mean that you can't tailor make Fusion then to work as best as it can for you and the way that you want it to work. So let's take a quick look at some of my top tips uh, and favourite defaults that I've set. The first one I'm going to choose is in the facing operation. So everyone probably does the facing operation, it's the most used toolpath, funnily enough. Um, so all I'm going to do, I'm just going to quickly select a tool here for me, so I'm going to select the face mill I normally use. Let's go into our tool library, tool 19 is our face mill. Um, and I'm just going to hit OK now. So it's going to make the toolpath. Now some of you might be going, that doesn't look like their default. What normally happens is the tool does its turning motion here, does its lead and linking the green motion. So that's what normally happens. If I go back into passes here, it's this pass extension. I'm going to right click and go make default. Ah, not right me up. Reset to default. I've changed it. Let's turn that to zero, everyone. Let's, let's try and do this the right first time. So what you see here is the cutting move is going to come along, and then it's going to swing across and then re-engage here and come across again. But the people who have done machining ops before will know a little problem with this. Let's have a quick look at what the problem with this is. We'll actually simulate this and I start moving that across. What you see here now is when I swing around, I'm still in that. If I turn my, let's turn the tool off. So that's the tip of my tool there. And I'm swinging around. This feed rate where this green move is, is a lot higher than the blue move because it's the cutting rather than the lead in. You can see there, see the cutter cutting away the material while it's still in that green motion? So you've got to think the problem you're going to have there is that material is going to be removed at a much higher feed rate than your cutting feed rate. And that's probably not what you're going to want. I hope that makes sense. It's not an easy thing to show, and it's not. It's even worse to explain. I'm not the best at explaining things like this. But what you can see there is because of the way that the tool has to swing around to do the next pass, the linking feed rate is higher. Now, I don't want to slow down the linking feed rate. Um, which will be here, the lead-in lead in feed. I don't want to slow that down. I want to leave that nice and high. But what we're going to have, if I go into the passes, is I can do this pass extension there. So I've got a 50mm diameter cutter. So, of course, it's the radius that I want to go past the ends to come back again. So I could put 25mm in there. I normally go a little bit more, so let's put 30 in, just to make it nice and round. And let's hit OK. Right, that's perfect. It's working really nice. It's going to, the tool, let's simulate that and have a look at how it's going to work. So let's simulate. Let's go across. So we can see now, we're going to turn that tool off again, that I completely leave the blue move. I then curl around, and then you see I'm now into the blue move again before I hit the material on the other side. So you can see that I'm only cutting material while I'm in that blue cutting motions, not while I'm in the lead in and lead out motions. Something that I actually showed an Autodesk employee the day, which I'd never known before, if you right click and go view toolpath, you get this really nice dialog pop up that actually shows you what's going on at the different rates. So we can actually have a look and see what's going on in the different moves. We can click and we can move the tool around 
as we go, so we can see where the different bits are. So that's also because it's quite handy. But the problem with this is now, if I right click, edit, let's face with my 10 millimeter end mill now. So if I'm going to face with my 10 millimeter end mill, where are we? We're here, 10 millimeter end mill. I've got these massive pass extensions on again. I don't need all those. I only need my tool radius plus a little bit. So let's go back into edit. What I'm going to do now in my passes, in my pass extensions, I'm going to right click and go edit expression. And what this brings is this nice spot box here. And I can now start putting in mathematical calculations. So let's think of one. Let's go for the tool. So you can see as I start to type, it's got whatever you want to call it, IntelliSense. So it's going to try and tell me the things that it knows it can get. So let's look for tool radius. No, it doesn't do that, but I know it does tool diameter. So I can do tool diameter. I can then divide that by two, which is going to give me the tool radius. So let's just hit OK. And you can see that five millimeters, that's perfect. It's a 10 millimeter tool. It's giving me about five millimeters. Spencer, I hope there are some wows in the comments at the moment. There may be. <laughs> yeah. no, there's, not, there's, not there's not too much. Uh, there is one question, though, a really, relatively uh, interesting one. Um, Jan would like to know whether he can use an expression um, for the feed and speed presets in the tool library. Um, what, he so wants to go like... He wants to be able to um, add the preset to the comment, for example. Um, so that the comment is, when you use that tool, the comment refers to what preset is being used. Do you get what I mean? The comment in the setup dialog. Comment in the tool. So in That's the tool on the post processor tab, there's a comment, isn't there? So oh, yes, what he's is, wanting yes. to do is to be able to uh, use the um, the preset value from the cutting data tab and reference it in the comment so that when he uses that tool, it appears, I'm guessing, at the top of the uh, uh, the NC code output. Oh, so it's going to tell you what the cutting feed rate is for that tool? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Interesting suggestion, isn't it? It is. I don't believe we can do that, but you should be able to do it through the post. Yeah. Okay. You need to. You, you need to be quite handy at post editing to be able to get the feed rate and put it up in there. But I don't think we can do it with the tool library. But you should be able to do it via the post. Yeah, agreed. Hope that answers your question, Jan. I hope it does. It so wasn't the answer you're looking for, but there will be probably a way of doing it through the post. I'm not good enough at post editing to do that live, never mind do it offline. Um, anyway, back to this example. So, tool down to times two. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to times it by 1.1. And that's just going to add 10% on for me. So, that now should go to 5.5. I'm going to right click and I'm going to make that now my default. So, that expression now is my default. So, let's hit OK. Let's make a new facing pass. Let's choose something different. So let's choose a 12 mil M mil. And what we should hopefully get now, if we go onto the passes tab, 6.6. .6. So we've got the tool radius times 10, uh, added on 10%. And that now means that my pass extension is always linked back to the tool that I'm using. And it's going to be there forever on my facing passes. So it's always going to make sure the tool exits the material does that U-turn and then comes back on? Crikey, Spence. <laughs> it's dying this end, sorry, buddy. It's always going to make sure it comes back at the cutting feed rate. So again, that was a little example on how to use the expressions there. Um, but now I'm going to show some really cool ways of actually how we can do this. So, um, right. I've got this block here. It's a little bit prescriptive, obviously, of what's going on. But hopefully it's going to show us what's actually going on here. So I've got M4 holes, M5 holes, M6, M8, M10. Um, these are the normal size holes that I do in the work that I do in the tech center. I don't tend to make big things that need M12s or tiny things that need M3s. These are like my standard range holes that I use. Um, so what I could do if I wanted to drill these, I could go in here, I could go drill. 
and I could go in select faces and I could choose that face and I could go set same diameter and I could do that. That's far too many clicks for my liking. So what can we do to try and get around this? Well, there's some really nice things on here called diameter range. So I could do diameter range and if we just inspect this hole beforehand, we know that it's 1.666. So for a metric thread, this isn't 100% correct, but I don't want to get into it. Basically, you take, if it's an M4, it's a 4 millimeter major diameter hole. And then if the pitch is half a mil, you take half a millimeter away, and then you end up with the minor diameter, which is what you drill at. I know that is not 100% correct, but I'm not going to start getting into the round off value that you have to add to the triangulation. I haven't got anywhere near enough time, but it's more than close enough what we're doing here to take the major diameter minus the pitch is the minor diameter. So we know there that 3.332 is effectively the minor diameter we're looking for for an M4. So if I go into drilling, and I now go into diameter range and I put 3.2 to 3.4, I just automatically selected all of those holes that are the correct pre-drill size for M4 without actually having to select anything. And we know what I've just said, that if I make these my default, it'll just do it for me automatically. That's brilliant. But what happens if I'm doing more than M4 holes? And you're thinking, hmm, there's got to be a way of doing this, isn't there, Richard? Yeah, well, there is, and that's what we're going to show you today. So what we've got here, this is, effectively, this is now a, a drilling. This is just a, let's go drilling, wrap it out, and let's choose my drill. So if I go on to here and go hole making drilling, I've got a, a M4 pilot drill, which is a 3.3 mil drill. And I'm now going to go on to diameter range here, and we've got 3.2. But I want to edit that expression. I want to use the tool diameter. But unfortunately, this is going to give me exactly the tool diameter. And if you put uh, minimum diameter as 3.3 and maximum diameter as 3.3, it won't find anything because there's nothing that exists between 3.3. So if I go tool diameter that, and let's times that by... 0.99. So what that's going to do is effectively give me 1% less than the tool diameter. And then I'm going to go in here, right click, edit, and you've guessed it, I'm going to do tool underscore diameter times that by 1.01. .01. That's going to give me 1% more than the tool diameter. That now, if I right click, make default, right click, make default, and hit OK, I've auto selected. If I duplicate that path, edit, let's now change my tool to my M5 pilot. Not turning, hold my key. Drills, my M5 pilot there. Hope you all saw that. It just instantly changed from M4 to M5 holes because it knows that that's the size that it needs to go and find to drill. It's scouring the model for everything between those two sizes, and it's doing that. Spence, if there were no wows before, there best be some wows now. There's some great conversations going, actually, about defaults and how to save defaults and stuff. Um, uh, somebody was asking if you could save tick box. Yes, uh, you can. Tick boxes. So I'm, I'm any, sure you'll get to that. Has anyone answered it yet? Well, I answered it, and I hope it was right. But I, I basically said that if you uh, you can do a make all defaults, if you keep all the yeah. settings the same, uh, there's, there's two take, ways of doing it. But change the tick box and then make all defaults. He actually mentioned using the compare and edit, well, which I'm yeah. guessing is the other method. I'll, yeah. I'll, show, I'll show that for everyone on the live stream in a minute. But yeah, I was going to answer that. But I hope you all are impressed with this auto drill finder. So what you've got now, effectively, in my drill. If I, you know, if I make all this de make these default now, every time I make a drilling operation, that's going to just find the holes it needs to drill based on the size of the drill. So that's absolutely brilliant. It's not just going to be for drilling and tapping. You can just go right, put a 10 mil drill in there. It's going to find every single 10 mil hole on your part and do that. 
really nice, really funky. How does it work with tapping though? So let's duplicate that draw one there. So let's edit this and let's pop in my M4 tap. So what I've got here now, uh, let's go back to hole making and let's go tap right hand. And I'm going to choose my M4 tap there. And most importantly, the pitch diameter of this. I know the pitch of this is 0.7. There you go, by 0.7. So I'm now going to go to the geometry and let's edit this expression. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the tool diameter. Let's just pop that in the brackets. And then I'm going to minus from that the, and this is one of the expressions that doesn't actually appear. So if Spencer can please pop in the chat um, the links that I sent you earlier. The links basically are to the Autodesk knowledge articles that tell you all of these parameters. So hopefully Spencer can pop that in and it's going to show you what we're going to do. But we need tool, let's have a good look. It's going to be tool underscore... Tool underscore thread pitch. That's what I'm after with a capital P. And then I actually need to make this now go 2% more because again, that, that round off figure that I spoke of earlier, it's a lot of calculations, too much for us to show today. So what I've got now is it's going to be my tool diameter minus my thread pitch um, minus 2%. And let's edit this expression here. And now let's paste that in and let's just go 1.02. Okay on that. And let's right click and let's make that default. And hit okay. Um, right hand tool set to work, not right hand tap. Very good of it to remind me I need to change that there to right hand tap. There we go, tapping right handed, perfect. So what we've got now is our auto tap. So this is our auto drill. And this is our auto tap. Let's um, duplicate that auto tap and prove that it works. So let's drag it below the M5. So this is the auto find for the M5s. Let's now edit this and let's swap to our M5 tap. So what I'm looking for is here, hole making, tap right hand, M5 tap. There we go, it's found all the M5 holes on our part automatically and it's doing it on there. How nice is that? So what that's effectively done is it's gone through, found all the holes, automatically applied the diameter range to them and it's found them all. So limitations that we've got here is it only looks in the tool axis. Um, but still, I mean, when I think about this, uh, this chick face plate that I've got here, Imagine if I could have done that on there. Look at all those holes I could have just automatically selected. I mean, I did do same diameter, but still, that's a few too many clicks for my liking. Let's really make this nice and productive for how I like to work. So what can we do now? Um, let's go back to the question I asked earlier about tick boxes. So I'm just going to start for the face toolpath. And in here, there's a tick box called multiple depths. And let's say I always want multiple depths on um, and because I want to use a finishing step of 0 0.1 on everything I do. Let's just say I'm going to do that and then I know that my facing I want, I don't, I want it to be one depth so I'm just going to put 100 in there just for, I won't do 100 because it's above the flute length, but 5 millimetres, let's argue that that's okay on there now. So I could right click and I could go make all default. So now if I cancel this and I go back and I go back to my face, you'll see now that it's remembered that. But there is another way. So let's turn that off. Let's turn that off. And let's right click, make all default. So because the whole problem here is you can't right click on a tick box because it selects it. So you need to right click on something other than a tick box or a drop down to go make all default. So that's what I've done there. Let's turn that back on again. Um, let's do a finishing step and let's hit OK on there now. Just got to choose my tool. So that was the one way of doing it. You just go make all default. The trick there is to open up the new, open up a dialog new. So open up that now and only change what you want to be changed because or else it will make everything else default. So if you made some other changes, it will start making all those default. 
So only make the single change you want to be made default. If you want to do that method of make all default, or what you can do is you can right click and go compare and edit. And then you get the compare and edit dialog open up. And then let's look for finishing step down. And now I can right click on that yes, and I can make that default that way. So that's another way of doing the same thing. That it's again, you have to go in the compare and edit dialog, but you can do them one at a time. The other way, you don't have to leave the dialog, but you have to do everything. So two different ways, whatever works best for you. So, right, let's get rid of that and let's carry on with what we were showing. How are we doing on the question, Spence? Any, uh, anything I should cover before I carry on? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, people are loving it. You've got some wow moments going on with your tool diameters, um, your drilling. Yeah, people are absolutely loving it. Um, I posted the two links, so if you if you if you want to get access to those, they're in the chat. Uh, and then Akash made a great comment. Love this. He said, "Like the stream, guys. There's 32 people watching and only 15 likes. Ouch, so that hurts. We need some more likes, I think." Yeah. So if you like the video, give us a like, and uh, don't be afraid to subscribe. And if you don't like the video, still give us a like. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then I asked what the people's favorite expressions are. So where do you use them? What's your favorite expression? How does it make you more productive? Uh, Klaus said he uses tool diameter everywhere um, to make sure everything's re related to the tools that he uses. Um, his, and then Jan said his face, his favorite is uh, engagement feed rate. Yep. Uh, most used is his feed tool feed underscore feed cutting. Um, because the set default on tools saves the number, not the in expression itself. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, Spencer, could you also put the expressions in the chat for people? I just of course I can. So a thing on those expressions is um, Spencer will put the ones in with the tapping in. What you could do is you can actually leave that out because, of course, drills don't have a thread pitch, so it will just make it zero. Um, or if you're a bit of a perfectionist, then you can actually just take that out for the drilling one. So but Spencer's giving you the expressions. Feel free to use them. Um, I don't want any royalties from that. Um, <laughs> you can go from there. So, right, so that's brilliant. I've got this whole auto-tap thing set up. But... I can make myself a lot more productive than this. So let's go back to the auto drill. Something on here I always do personally is I go drill tip through bottom. So the tip goes through the bottom. And also we know that you can never tap to the bottom of the hole because you'll snap your tap. So I'm going to put my heights up and I'm going to go whole bottom up three mil. And that's just for me, that's a really nice, safe generic that I can have in there. So yes, I can right click and make default like we're discussing today, but I'm going to show you one step further. So we've now got this drill and tap combo. Um, what I'm going to do is right click and go store as template. And what I can do now is name. So I'm going to just call this, I'm going to call this live stream M for drill and tap. Um, auto goodness, I think it should, it should be called. So this is now going to save a template in my Fusion account. So I'm going to save that, and there we go. And now, if you start watching what happens here, let me make a completely new setup. And I'm going to right click on that setup and go create from template, live stream, M4 drill and tap. Let's generate that toolpath. And it's going to find all the M4 holes on my part, drill them and tap them. How cool is that? Um, as you might have guessed, before the live stream, I set up them for all the different sizes. Let's add them all in. M4. Let's add in M5. Let's add in M6. Let's add in M8. And then finally M10. So now, with never selecting any geometry... On my part, I've used expressions to auto-detect all of these holes and drill and tap them at the right heights. The heights are safe for me. They all work. I mean, again, I need to be seeing some wows in the chats, everyone, and if not, some likes. Um, so what we've got there is, effectively, we've set the expressions up to make sure they work properly. We then stored those 
tool paths with the right heights in, with the right expressions in. We've stored those as templates. And then I now can call back that template at any point in any project and auto detect holes in the right orientation and drill and tap them. That works brilliant on this little demo block. Let's go back to this part I was making three weeks ago on the live streams for us all. I'm going to set up here. And I know that I've got M4 and M6 holes all over this part. So let's M4, M6. Let's generate those. Control G. Or let's right click so you can see what I'm doing. Hit a no. And there we go. Auto detected all those holes on my part from simply doing a few minutes worth of work with a clever expression and a template. What do people think, Spence? I think people are still amazed to uh, to have had any comments. Uh, expressions are awesome from Jan. Um, Jan also made a, 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 a plug to to Angelo's live stream. Oh, yeah. Uh, Angelo's, so, a... Angelo's the man. So Angelo is uh, doing a complex part of a one and done five axis live stream on the 11th of March. So if that's of interest, uh, go check it out. And I guess this is a good time to say uh, if you like the video, give us a like. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to us already, why not hit that little subscribe button? And when you do hit the subscribe button, there's a little bell. And that bell means that you'll never miss a live stream again or any upload because you'll be notified. And so you'll never miss another one of our live streams. You'll never miss one of Angelo's. And uh, you'll be... Uh, on the on the top of the of our, of our tree, I guess you could say. So um, yeah, subscribe, like. Back to you, Rich. Brilliant. Cheers, man. Thanks very much. So that was two really nice, simple um, expressions. And again, I've now got those as templates. You've got the template library, and you can see I've got that one that we just did, and then I've got all my other ones on there as well. I can export those and give them to a friend i can give them to anyone else in my company or we can even put them in the in the shared teams folders however you want to use them so these are imagine you know and i put notes on there that depths still need to be set i've made sure they're safe but they're probably not what i want because again sometimes if you know if you model a through hole you want to go down a lot further and put the tap right through if you're a blind these are set up for blind holes so that's the safer option but if it's a through hole, I'll want to adjust those heights myself. But again, just think of how many clicks that's saving me. Think of all the parts all the time. Again, really nice, cool stuff. You really do realize that how little of a software package you use. And when I'm saying I'm talking about Fusion, any other software package you can think of, Adobe, Microsoft, whoever you can think of, you really only ever use a tiny proportion of it. And Fusion is exactly the same. And things like this, hopefully now you're all going to realize that you, you can use them, there's nothing special about them, there's nothing really too challenging to set these up. You can just go ahead and set these templates up there again. You can set templates up for turning that do facing, profile cutting, grooving, and then you can just hopefully apply that to your part generally. But this was a, a nice example that I thought well, hopefully we can get some quick context in a very quick live stream going on there. So there you go, got my auto tapping gone on. Right. I want to show you how powerful expressions can actually be, though. So I've got this block here, and yes, I know I could face the top of it off, but I don't want to do that. I want to use a ball nose and profile it, because imagine this is not flat, but I really wanted to try and show you. My theory is if I make the examples easy, then they're easy to follow. If I show you this on a big mold tool, it tends to get a bit more complicated, but hopefully you can get the principles on a simple part and then apply them to more complex shapes as we go. So we're going to do a 3D parallel path on here. And I'm going to choose a 8mm ball nose. So let's go on there. I'm going to go milling, ball nose, 8mm ball nose on there. I'm going to go to passes. Now, we've got something here called step over. That's how far that tool steps over as it goes across the park. Which is brilliant. We can all think in step overs. But really, we don't... We don't actually care much about the step over. I care about the finish that the step over produces. The step over, I don't care what the step over is. I just want to make sure I get the right finish on my path. And what you have when you're using a ball nose or a ball nose is a cusp. Now, 
hopefully you all know what a cusp is. A cusp is when the tool, the ball nose, steps over, it's the little quadrant of material that's left from that step over. Now, of course, the tighter the step over, the smaller the cusp is. If people don't know what cusp is, I'll try and draw one on the screen, but hopefully you know, because it's not so, I should have probably prepared a nice slide for that, but I'm, I'm nowhere near organised enough for that. But what you can do is you can actually use an expression to get around this, because all that cusp actually is, is a mathematical working out of a triangle. Again, there's no way I'm going to do this working out for you live, but here's what I prepared earlier. So what we've got here is the calculation to actually work out the step over from the cusp height. So Spencer, feel free to chuck that in the chat for people. Will do. So what I can type in now is I want a cusp height of 0.1. I'm going to hit OK. And it's calculated that I then need a step over of 1.776 to give me a cusp height of 0.1. Let's just turn that through nice and breeze, just for this example. And I'm going to chuck a simple boundary on there. I just want to contain it for there for the moment. So now I can simulate this, and we can go across. And what we see here now, again, is it's come up really nicely, and that's that one millimetre cusp pipe on there. So we've got one millimetre cusps and that's what we've got. So if I wanted to change it to 0.1 millimetre cusp, I'd go into here, I'd right click and go edit expression and I would go 0.01. I always hit enter, but it, enter of course is enter, it's not okay. And now I've changed to 0.56 or 0.58 and you can see it's changed it from there. So again, if you think it in cusp heights, if you want to know a set cusp height, you know, you might know, for those of you that think in RA values, the roughness average values, this effectively is the roughness average value um, in microns normally. So you could start to program this using the RA values rather than having to think about step overs. So hopefully that's really useful to some people. Um, someone asked me this once, and again, I'm... A little bit sad, so I spent a Friday afternoon working out that calculation. I'm not that good at mathematics, so it took me far too long to work out. Um, but yeah, it's quite a nice little equation. Now the problem is, is when you get on a sloped face, this is a 10 degree slope here, it doesn't quite work the same. So if I put a chain around there, unfortunately, as the tool is going down, the step over is from this tool axis, but it's actually traveling further down the slope. Imagine it's like the hypotenuse. It travels further down the slope than what it does across the slope. I hope that makes sense. And as you'd hope, um, I then made the equation for that. So again, Spencer, feel free to chuck that one in the chat now as well. So the Google moderator team is blocking our uh, oh, no. expressions for some reason. But what I said is we'll make sure to, once the video goes live, we'll add the uh, the expressions in the comments. Yeah, the comments. Oh, that's gutting, that is. Sorry, everyone. So, right, cusp height here, I want to set that to 0 0.1. And then slope, um, if it was flat, I could do zero, or I'll set that to 10 degrees. I'm going to hit OK, and this is now calculated the step over needed to get a 0.1 millimetre cusp on there as we go down. So if you're on a flat plane or an inclined plane, you can now use that equation to calculate the step over needed for a specific cusp height. Now I know if you've got varying slopes, this is not going to be clever enough to actually start changing that step over to make sure you get a consistent cusp height. I'm nowhere near clever enough to get an expression to do that, and I think we need to put some changes in the fusion. Um, but again, remember that if you want to keep that there, you want to make sure that you right-click and make that your default. So what that's going to do effectively is always make sure that I've got a cusp height, and I change that to 0.1, um, make that my default, and now if I come in to do a new parallel path, we'll see that I've got the step over there, 
because it's all driven from the tool, I come in and I change the tools. So let's go to a let's go to a smaller ball nose, milling ball nose, six more ball nose. You can see now this is automatically updated to give me that constant cusp height across our part. So hopefully we've shown you how to make the best use out of expressions. Last thing before I leave you, um, please share these with your friends, with your colleagues, with other people in the workshop. You've got your template, template library, you can share them with as well. Then what you can actually use, you can export your defaults. So you can export your defaults and everything you've ticked in defaults then will get saved. And you can make sure then that you can, this is also really handy if you're having a backup in case you accidentally mess up your defaults. And you can also share this between colleagues or you could actually have different defaults for different machines. Might not be the best way around it, but for your workflow, well, I'm not here to tell you what, what's right and what's wrong. Um, especially for something like me, where one machine's a has and the other one's a little hobbyist machine, I program them so differently, it might make sense for me to have two lots of defaults that I switch between. But yep, you can export your defaults, name it whatever you like, and then you can manage and input your defaults there as well. So again, thanks everyone for joining. Um, let's do a bit, a bit of Q&A, Spence. Yeah, well, I mean, you got a few wows. Um, uh, Chris Northall, I don't know if it is our Chris Northall is it or ours? a different Chris Northall, but he said, have a wow, guys. I'm a hard person to get a wow from. Fusion con continues to impress me daily. Well, thanks, Chris. Whether you are Chris or another Chris, thank you very much. Uh, what else have we got? So Jan asked if your hole and tap range thing uh, can also work with multiple axes, uh, or is this something that only hole recognition can do? So yes and no, it will only work in the setup axis direction. Yeah. That's what so I if say. I or the tool orientation direction, hole recognition will recognise the whole part and go around it and apply it all. Um, but you know, I'm here to try and make sure you get the most bang for your buck, and this is a really nice way of effectively almost using the whole recognition style things um, with templates. So again, if I wanted to spot drill, then drill, then tap. Because when I created that expression, remember, I, I highlighted two tool paths, right click, store as template. So if I wanted to spot drill in there, I would have gone drill, um, let's try this quickly because I don't want to waste too much time on this. I could have gone spot drill, um, hole making, spot drill, there we go. And I could have chosen the spot drill and I've gone diameter range. The trouble with the diameter range here is the spot drill diameter is the wrong one. So you'd have to do some fiddling around to get it to work. But you get it to work for the 4 mil template. So you could change your expression here to actually do it as as four millimeter again because this is being stored in a template it doesn't matter that i'm hard coding the expression uh, you get the idea so i've now got a spot drill in place um and now mess that one up entirely while trying to talk and do it at the same time but you get what i mean so effectively what you've got there you've got your spot drill in you would save that up in here and you now have a three tool path template with spot drill drill and tap absolutely uh and then the age-old question of um can you carry user parameters from the design workspace into the cam workspace so does anyone remember what I was talking about this morning where we can see into the future, but you can't? No, you can't currently. Um, please, please trust me when I say that is a big priority um, on us to make sure that France is getting that passed through. So Absolutely. as of today, the 4th of March, 2021, the answer is no. Um, I'm hoping that I'll be on a live stream at some point in the future and be able to show that as, as a watch new update. Absolutely. And uh, that's it. That's all your comments. Cheers. For Thanks, today. everyone. Um, I always aim for half an hour, and I always run over, so my timekeeping definitely isn't something that I profess to be good at. Um, but hopefully you've all had something out of this today. Again, if every one of these live streams helps out one person, then we've done a good job. So 
Brilliant. Happy. Yeah, thanks everybody. Don't forget to subscribe, like, hit us up in the comments of, of what you want to see in future live streams. And I hope the uh, the little forum intro was well received. Let us know. Did you like it? Did you not like it? How could we do it better? Always looking to improve. Might challenge some people to try and uh, knock some others off that top 10 list. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Cheers, everyone. See you all again next time. Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>